Welcome to Forthright. I'm Sulani Madsen and delighted to bring you a podcast with last week's Spokesman Review column inspired by a landmark familiar to anyone who's ever visited Sacred Heart Medical Center. And it's an appropriate topic for April as Earth Month as we focus on being good stewards, faithfully conserving the Earth's resources. Here with is the column first published April 5th, 2024 in the Spokesman Review headlined, Deconstructing the Future for Mary's Place. It is hard to overlook the big white house at 104 West 8th Avenue on the way to the front door of Sacred Heart Medical Center. The challenge to saving Mary's place is location, location, location. To the dismay of Spokane historic preservation aficionados, Mary's son and heir, George Alex, took out a demolition permit last year. But there is a spectrum of options spanning between the polar opposites of a wrecking ball or canonization as an historic artifact. Besides simple demolition, there's relocation to a new site, selective salvage before demolition, or complete deconstruction. That last option, deconstruction, is included in the 2021 Washington State Building Code as Appendix Z. It only applies if adopted by each local jurisdiction, which Spokane has not done, nor should it. But construction is a concept worth promoting without adding more red tape to growth and development. Mary's Place is the kind of place Appendix Z targets. A nice 1906 house, but not particularly distinguished in a city with many fine houses built in the same era. Its once quiet residential neighborhood was long ago displaced by the regional medical centers sprawling across the formerly residential Lower South Hill. Its primary claim to historic significance is mere survival, thanks to two stubborn and strong-willed women. Sacred Heart's sister Peter Claver met her match in Mary Gionetsis, and the new hospital that Claver built had to be designed around the house that Gionetsis refused to sell short. With rumors of the property being purchased to expand a parking lot, a nascent movement to save Mary's place is forming. But healthy cities are not static places, and Mary's place is in the wrong place. Relocation is not impossible, but a difficult option given the steep terrain on each side of 8th Avenue and the distance to a suitable lot of adequate size. Demolition with salvage of a few readily recycled materials is common, but deconstruction goes beyond a few fixtures and scrap metal to recapture materials like structural lumber and fine finishes. Appendix Z defines deconstruction as the systemic excuse me, the systematic disassembly of a structure in order to salvage building materials or components for the primary purpose of reusing materials to the maximum extent possible with a secondary purpose of recycling the remaining materials. End quote. The result is much less to haul to a landfill and much more salvage for reuse. Diamond parking is sometimes cast as the villain in this sort of classic historic preservation standoff, but they don't own the building, according to Dan Geiger, Vice President for Diamond Parking in the Spokane region. Geiger is a Spokane native who pointed out that Diamond owns and carefully maintains the Parson Paulson building and other non-parking real estate. Quote, I personally like to see things reused and salvaged, not just destroyed. I will be looking to learn more about deconstruction. It's an interesting concept, Geiger said. For Dave Benick, seeing the massive amount of waste from the demolition of Bellingham's Mount Baker High School was the inspiration for a new business. Since forming Reuse Consulting in 1993, he has done more than merely advise people on how to make it work. We're not here just to talk about it. We actually do it, and we use that experience to advise others, Benick said in an interview. We started our operation, had a store for the materials, learned how to do deconstruction so we could do it more affordably. We got better at it, so now we know how to do it faster. It's not a special service we have to charge more for. We're set up to do this for a living, and we're on year 32, end quote. Kinley Deller, coordinator for King County's Construction and Demolition Program, was one of the people who developed the code language for Appendix Z and has shopped it around seeking municipalities to adopt it. Quote, Portland, Oregon adopted a similar code requirement about 10 years ago, Deller said. It originally applied to residential demolition for houses built in 1916 or earlier. Then they amended and changed the threshold to 1940. End quote. Deller said there are now 13 different deconstruction companies competing for the work, making it the same cost as plain old demolition. 
Bennett cautioned patients, quote, if a city is thinking of adopting any new kind of new mandates, we tell them it just doesn't happen overnight. When we helped Portland get started, we had to train contractors on how to do it, then get the public educated on what is deconstruction, and then let people know there's a supply of reclaimed materials available that wasn't there before. Contractors worry about being stuck with all this material. Changing the work landscape is precarious, end quote. Systematically taking apart a house does more than keep waste out of the landfill. It's ultimately a conservative attitude, looking at a house as a resource to be mined for maximum return rather than a liability to be knocked over. Compare the quality of wood stud framing in a 1940s rancher to what you see in a lumber yard today, and the value of deconstruction is obvious. It takes advantage of market forces to encourage growth of skills and products. Our role in training people is to shorten their learning curve to teach contractors in 10 year, days what we learned over 10 years, Benick said. Even the average well-built house deserves to be constructed, end quote. And Mary's place is above average. Now, at, at the age of five or six, I used to enjoy riding along in the Studebaker pickup to the dump with my dad. Uh, there was lots going on. It seemed kind of dangerous and now we'd call it a landfill, but it was seemed a more exciting place when it was just a dump. I also have fond memories of salvaging materials in the Studebaker. I remember driving to a site where a big old house was being torn down on the lower South Hill, not far from Mary's place, to make way for commercial construction. That was an even more dangerous looking place than the dump and I wasn't allowed to get out of the pickup, but the sights and sounds of deconstruction were enchanting. My dad filled the back of a pickup with salvaged bricks for some backyard project he had in mind that never seemed to happen. Those bricks were an inspiration of, for hours of play, and eventually we kids laid them roughly as pavers between two arbor vitae in the backyard to create the outline of imaginary playhouse. They're still there at my mother's house. That old house that was being torn down was replaced by the IBM building, which is itself now listed as an historic structure. Cities don't remain static, and what is saved is often a matter of chance as much as anything. But even when change needs to happen, there's no reason to waste good materials and fill up the landfill. Uh, this topic was a lot of fun to research because the love of old buildings was a big part of my career in architecture. The conversation with Dave Benick, the deconstruction man, included a lot more detail that didn't fit into the column. And here are some of my notes from that interview. I was typing as fast as I can, so this is almost a transcript of our conversation. Dave asked, why does anything have to get wasted nowadays? Everyone is concerned about liability, time, costs. When you're trying to take people who don't do this for a living, who don't do it every day, it looks risky. They bid higher. They're in a hurry. A demo contractor may look at it as an opportunity to bid higher. A general contractor has a schedule to keep. A property owner may look at it and say, I have a budget to meet and deconstruction is going to cost too much or take too long. There's lots of reasons why something isn't going to work. The question is, what does it take to make it work? You don't have to do everything the first day, but you should do something. You don't have to start a whole industry on day one. As things develop, it makes it easier and easier for cities to start and invent, incentivize this type of work before putting mandates in place. Now, as I said before, I, I'm not in favor of mandates, uh, but I would like to see us change the culture of, of tossing away things to really really conserve the all of the all of the wonderful materials every every building that went up has a lot of human um, human hands have touched every piece of it and when we can't save a building uh, when it does need to be be uh, the, the site needs to be something else we can deconstruct the building that was there and salvage more than just a few old bricks so to the current owner of Mary's place what does it take to make it work to provide the time for deconstruction instead of hauling beautiful woodwork and uh, some wood framing that I'm sure is in gorgeous condition off to the landfill. Be sure to subscribe at Substack with or without a pledge for notifications of new content via, via email from the platform. Uh, take advantage of the opportunity to comment on this and previous posts or to email suggestions for new topics. And as always, reference links for this column will be included after the video link in the Substack post. Thanks for listening.